This weekend, I was reminded of a great joke President Reagan told in the 80s. He said, um, there was a politician and a reverend that died on the same day and they went to heaven. And uh, St. Peter said, come on guys, I'll show you to your rooms. So first he brought the reverend uh, to his room. He opened the door and the politician peeked his head in and was like, wow, figured he would have got a nicer room than this. It was just a tiny little room with a cot in it. And uh, the reverend went inside and then uh, St. Peter said, come on, I'll take you to your room. And the politician's thinking, man, if this godly man, this reverend got such a tiny room, I can't, I can't believe what kind of room I'm going to get. I don't even know what to expect. St. Peter brings the politician to his room. He opens the door and he has this huge suite with like a quadruple size, king size bed. It's just a beautiful, magnificent suite that you would think a prince would live in. And the politician was confused. He's like, St. Peter, I don't understand. That reverend, that godly man, got such a tiny room. I'm just a two-bit politician. Why do I get such a beautiful suite? And St. Peter answered and said, well, you have to understand how things work up here. We get reverends every day. This is the first time a politician ever came up here. <laughs> so uh, I thought that was funny. Uh, man, I miss Ronald Reagan. But, um, but it had me thinking, as recently as the 80s, traditional men revered. The word reverend comes from the root word revere respect it pastors and priests and holy men especially the pope you know and one thing that was very disheartening when i came over to the catholic church were to listen to these men who call themselves catholic just totally have no reverence for our holy father like talk about him like he's some punk on the street and you know one guy in particular you know i listened to him like wow you say you're traditionalist. Well, just go back 40 years, please, to the 80s, <laughs> where no Catholic would think of bashing the Pope like you are. You know, have respect for, for, for his, his office, at least, if you don't respect the man. My goodness, it just blows my mind. Um, and I just want to talk about getting back to tradition. This video is not about one man. This video is about probably two of the biggest, the biggest frictions in the church right now about tradition or modernism and uh, i'm gonna give you my take and you know like i said i came back to the catholic church i was you know protestant for 30 years and i said some vile things about the popes during that time that i'm ashamed of and then i hear catholic you know guys that say they're catholic saying the same thing and i was like whoa and um you know a couple thoughts on that, and then I'll get to the two main subjects at hand. So, so you know, when I was a Protestant, I used to see these word of faith prosperity preachers uh, just take advantage of the flock, you know, and I would see their net worths, you know, millions of dollars, and they live in these million dollar homes, and I knew their motivation, you know. And then when I would, you know, criticize the people were like, well, you're Pentecostal, you're charismatic. You know, it was my background. I'm like, yeah, but you know, that's in the Bible, but these guys teach and aren't in the Bible. And they would give me all these Bible quotes they're saying, well, they quote this, everything they're saying is scripture. And I'd be like, you know, Jesus was quoted scripture by Satan. <laughs> Satan knows scripture too. Just because someone's quoting scripture doesn't mean they're right. You have to take the scriptures in context. And, um, and I understood these people had itching ears. They told them what they already wanted to know. So they would just, you know, I would see, I would see people that could barely pay their rent, send these guys a lot of money. And these guys live in million dollar mansions and fly around in jets and take trips to Europe, you know? And, uh, you know, I try to speak the truth and, you know, people would say I was jealous of their money. And I would say, you know, I want to be like St. Paul. St. Paul told the Corinthians he was homeless. St. <laughs> Paul, St. Paul said he he had a, he made tents to make his own way. You know, Jesus was a carpenter. He made a living by sweating in the in the sun and hammering nails, physical labor. You know, the apostles were so broke when uh, the tax collector asked them uh, for their taxes, they didn't even have one coin to give them. St. Peter had to ask Jesus, and Jesus did a miracle and said, you know, open that fish. 
I'll, uh, I'm sorry. I could, um, so anyway, you know, when that, whenever you, uh, point out something you think is untrue, people are going to, you know, attack you. So that's, that's, you know, comes with the territory. But this one guy in particular, that's always bashing the Pope, uh, you know, people say, oh, you're jealous of his money. Oh, you know, you're no theologian. This guy, you know, has, you know, a bunch of fancy degrees. He paid a lot of money for these degrees. You have no education. And they're right. You know, I do blue collar and a scholar. You know, I've had Dr. Scott Hahn, uh, Dr. Francis Beckwith, a lot of, you know, scholars on my show. And no one's going to mistake me for the scholar. <laughs> when they say blue collar and a scholar, they know who the blue collar guy is and who the scholar. So I don't pretend to be a scholar, you know. But one of the most scholarly guys I had was Dr. Robert P. George. You know, I get all these guys' bios and their resumes. And nobody was even close to this guy. This guy, literally, Robert P. George, conservative, politically conservative, and a strong Catholic believer, Catholic Christian. He literally had multiple doctorate degrees from Oxford University, Harvard, Stanford. I think the guy had like 20 degrees. I'm not even exaggerating, but he's a, he's a Princeton professor. And he said something very interesting. He said, I can dialogue with anybody because I know I could be wrong. <laughs> and he's right. He could be wrong. And I could be wrong. I'm just giving you my point of view from a blue collar guy who was an anti-Catholic for many years, a Protestant for 30 years, who studied the Bible every day. So maybe I can give you a fresh perspective or another way to look at it and think about it. And again, I could be wrong. But if you're only hearing one side to every argument, it's not good. You should always hear another side. So, you know, when I hear, when I heard this guy for the first time, uh, you know, bashing the Pope, I kind of got a little suspicious, so I did a little research on him, and his net worth is about the same as these prosperity preachers, you know, that I disagreed with as a Protestant. So I'm thinking maybe that's his motivation, I don't know, you know, you know, I don't know, you know, and people, again, they'll say, you know, well, look at all his degrees, you know, the Bible says knowledge puffs us up you know and sometimes that could lead to pride and the bible says pride comes before the fall the bible also says in the last days people will be lovers men will be lovers of themselves boastful and arrogant this is how this guy comes across it also says in the last days many will profess to be wise and they'll become fools and in my humble opinion if you go against the church you're a fool <laughs> you know <laughs> Martin Luther went against the church, and Martin Luther is dead and gone, but the church is still here. Diocletian went against the church. Diocletian is dead and gone, but the church is still here. Nero went against the church. Nero's dead and gone, but the church is still here. Nietzsche said God is dead. Nietzsche's dead, and the church is still here. So as Father Blake Britton said on my show the other night, it's always wise to err on the side of the church. If you're confused of what some man's saying with a bunch of fancy degrees and what the church is saying, you better err on the side of the church. Now, that being said, that's number one. We want to get back to tradition. Let's honor our uh, fathers, our bishops, and of course, the Holy Father. Let's show them the reverence they deserve. And, and of course, we could disagree with them. I don't agree with everything Pope Francis says or does. But I respect him and I honor him. And part of tradition is following canon law. Canon law 1404 says the first C, that's the Pope, is judged by no one. So I'm not going to judge him and call him a heretic like this guy actually called him a heretic. Came right out and said he's a heretic. I'm not going to call him an anti-Pope like some have called him an anti-Pope or insinuated he could be. You know, part of being a Catholic Christian is knowing that sacred tradition is equal to sacred scripture. And sacred tradition is all our councils. Even Vatican II, if you don't like Vatican II. If you don't accept Vatican II, you're what they call a sit of a canist. It's not a good place to be. And it's not a good place to lead people there. It's not a good place. Jesus said, if you lead one of these little ones away, it's better you have a millstone put around your neck and thrown into the sea. So that's some dangerous territory leading people into Vaticanistism. I think that's how you say it. But, um, but I'm not here to just, you know, point out one man's fault. Because, again, 
I could have faults, you know, I do have faults. You know, I talked about um, Gilligan's Island, you know, the seven deadly sins that each guy on the show represented. You know, we're all tempted by those same seven deadly sins. So, you know, I'm just, again, I just want to show you something maybe you haven't heard. So getting back to tradition, let's get back to tradition. When I came back to the Catholic Church, I read myself into the Catholic Church by reading the scriptures and seeing the Catholic Church was the church of the first century. And then when I was going through RCIA and the priest taught about receiving communion, he said, you can receive it on your tongue or you can receive it in your hand. And I said, well, I want to receive it like they did in the first century. And he said, well, they received it on their hand. And my research showed me you know, up until about the 8th century or 9th century, I think up until like the 900s, it was the norm to receive it in the hand, you know? And, uh, I mean, you could just look in the scriptures, the, the apostles, you don't see any ancient paintings. I mean, we have paintings going way back in the Catholic Church. You don't see any where Jesus is putting the Eucharist on the tongue. People are receiving it in their hand. And, and you can read in the scripture where it said Judas dipped his his uh, bread into the wine. So he had it in his hand, you know? Um, now, like Father Blake Britton pointed out, just because something is more ancient doesn't mean it's the most reverent way, you know? The church can change doctrine, but we can develop. So maybe, you know, it is more reverent to kneel and let it be put on your tongue. But that's the argument. Is it more reverent to receive it in your hand like they did in the first centuries, the early church? Or is it more reverent to receive it on your tongue like they started in the nine, in 900 AD, I believe? That's the argument. Don't call me a modernist because I receive it the way they did in the first century. The way I see it, and again, I'm just a blue collar guy. I'm just giving you blue collar common sense. To me, if I receive it the way the apostles did in the first, second, third century Christians did, and you receive it the way they started in the 10th century or 9th or 10th century, you're the modernist. <laughs> Don't call me a modernist. You're the modernist. My way is more ancient. Again, it may not be as reverent. That, that's the argument, and we can learn from one another. But don't tell me I'm being a modernist because I'm obeying the church that gives me the option and I'm choosing to go with the option of the first century Christians. And, and if you don't believe me, I mean, you can look at history, but I'll just read you a great saint from the fourth century. I mean, he, gave, he actually gave instructions to those about to be baptized. And this is what he said. Um, I'm gonna have to put my glasses on, it's really small. This is in the fourth century, St. Cyril of Jerusalem. He instructed those preparing for baptism. When they receive communion, when they receive Holy Communion, they should place one hand on top of the other, palms up, in order to make a throne to receive the king. And that's how I was taught to receive it. You know, but if I chose, the church allows us to kneel and have it received on the tongue. And... I've never been to a church that restricted either way. You can receive it either way. And many in my parish receive it on the hand and many receive it on the tongue. That's the church's teaching. And traditionally, we trust our church. We're not, you know, Bible alone where we only say, well, the Bible says do it this way. The Bible, they received it on their tongue, so we should only receive it on our tongue. No, we believe Jesus gave the authority to church and the church developed the way that some believe was more reverent. So, you know, that's number one. Number two, the big thing is... Um, you're a modernist because you listen to the mass in your own language. You know, in my case it would be English. Again, the, the early Christians heard it in their own language, either Greek, Aramaic, Hebrew, wherever they were. By, I believe it was like by the fourth century, the church started uh, a universal language of Latin and it's beautiful. And as Father Blake Britton pointed out, Vatican II, says you must, you must uh, have Latin in the mass and you may have the vernacular in the mass. So in other words, you gotta, you gotta speak in Latin in the mass, but for pastoral reasons, like giving a homily where people can understand, it's good to say it in the language everybody can understand and the local prayers. 
but the Eucharistic prayer, the universal church prayers should be said in Latin. And also Father Blake Britton, the guy who researched Vatican II documents more than anyone, I think, and you know, today and, and you know, live today, he said nowhere in the Vatican II documents does it say um, the priest can't uh, face the East. What do they call that? Uh, ad orientum, you know? So a lot of people criticize Vatican II based on what they hear about Vatican II. And, um, you know, I was guilty of just going by Vatican II by, from what I heard too. So I'm going to actually get the documents and study them myself like Father Blake Britton uh, recommends. And uh, if you didn't see the video, you, if you didn't see the interview, you really got to see it. I did it Friday night. Uh, so Father Blake Britton reclaiming Vatican II. Um, and um, his book, uh, the same name, Reclaiming Vatican II, is very insightful. You'll get a whole new love for Vatican II. If you hate Vatican II, you need to read this book. <laughs> Seriously. Because there's a lot of misconceptions. A lot of people said things about, and they still say things about Vatican II that are just not true. You know, and it's a major ecumenical council. It's equal to scripture. So, you know, you cannot disobey Vatican II, you know. And Vatican I, you know, also says you cannot judge the Pope. I mean, there's, it all goes together. You can't be, we can't be like Protestants and cherry pick what we believe, you know, if it's official church teaching, seriously, you know, and I, I've had three that I know of, probably more because when I was, you know, first started this, I didn't even know this was a controversy, but I had three brothers that I love dearly on my show that disagree with me on the Latin mass and disagree with me on communion in the hand. But they don't judge me, and I don't judge them. Um, you know, like I said, like Robert P. George said, we could be wrong, you know. And um, St. Augustine, I used to quote when I was a Protestant, it's kind of funny. St. Augustine said, on the essentials of the faith, there must be unity. On the non-essentials, liberty, and all things charity. Now, with a Protestant, it all depends on your interpretation of the Bible, what you think is essential and non-essential. Uh, but as a Catholic, it's easy. We can just look at the official church teachings. So if the magisterium says you could take it in the hand or you could take it on the tongue, you can have mass in Latin or you can have mass in the vernacular, then there's no argument. That's, you know, it's preference. Now, Two of these guys are, are elders in the faith, and I learned from them, and I've learned things, and they've changed my mind. I say elders, they've been in the faith much longer than me. One's actually younger. One looks younger, but looking at his resume, it seems like he's my age or older. Uh, so maybe I'll ask him, because I think we're going to have him back on here shortly. We're just trying to work out our schedules. And, um, and again, you know, we could dialogue, we're brothers, you know. I know he loves me, I love him. I know he loves the Lord, I love the Lord. I know he loves the church. And we see um, we see the devil at work and we're both doing our part to fight him. And we have different, we have different ministries, you know. So you might be surprised that this guy's my buddy when he comes on, but you know, I believe he's the real deal and he's doing what he believes God is showing him to do. And, I'm doing what I believe God is showing me to do. So just because we're not, you know, echoing what each other says, <laughs> doesn't mean that we're not in unity. Again, in the essentials, let there be unity and then non-essentials, liberty and, and all things uh, charity. Now, a lot of people will say, well, you're saying we could say it in Latin, we could say it in the vernacular, but Pope Francis is coming down hard and not letting people have their Latin mass. And I don't know if that's exactly an honest statement. You know, I remember when Trump was president, all the liberals called him a fascist until the pandemic hit and he didn't act like a fascist and they wanted him to act like a fascist. You know, he gave each governor the right to run their state the way they chose was best for their state. And the liberals were crazy. They wanted, they wanted every state to be run like California and New York and us freedom American, uh, freedom loving Americans 
we're thankful that he gave each governor. So Ron DeSantis became a superstar. We've seen that he actually did believe in freedom. And we've seen Governor Newsom was a uh, fascist communist <laughs> dictator. And it was rules for thee and not for me. He gave the most draconian, draconian uh, restrictions on his state. Yet he was apparently not afraid of COVID because he went to parties with no mask. He was caught going to restaurants. He was caught breaking every rule. So we got to see the good governors and the bad governors. In the same way, people call Pope Francis this dictator, this, this fascist, yet he's given local bishops, and we're seeing some bishops are good and some bishops are not. <laughs> you know, Keith Nestor was on my show. He loves the Latin mass, and he said his bishop is fine with it. He said he, he didn't see any difference. He, his bishop allows him, he said, but he has friends that really feel hurt and wounded and can't understand why their bishop is being so harsh. And I, I don't understand it either. You know, I don't think it's good. I think they should all be like Keith Nestor's bishop and allow people to have the Latin mass. But, you know, we don't know everything, you know? And like I told someone today, they were asking me about Pope Francis. Why is he doing this? Why is he doing that? And I said, I don't know, you know, my, jo my job is not to judge him. Canon Law 1404, first he is judged by no one. But let me give you a little different perspective, you know? And you may have heard me say this before, during uh, World War II, uh, Pope Pius XII was criticized for years because he would not condemn the Nazis. He would not condemn Hitler. He said he wanted to stay neutral. And, you know, all the Protestants were like, he's a Nazi, you know, he's responsible for all these deaths. And they still say that today. And then after the war ended, the state of Israel gave Pope Pius XII the highest civilian honor, the highest civilian medal, because he saved over 800,000 Jews by hiding them in our churches, in the Vatican, even the Pope's personal home. And the reason he stayed neutral, because he knew if he condemned Hitler, if he condemned the Nazis, then they would invade the churches, take over the churches, and there would have been 800,000 Jews killed. So... Imagine if there was YouTube back then what some of these Catholic YouTubers would have been saying about the Pope. They say vile things about Pope Francis. Imagine what they would have said about someone they thought was collaborating with the Nazis. I'm just saying, we don't know everything. You know, Pope Francis is the Pope of the Universal Church. He sees a lot more, hears a lot more. He's playing with some dangerous men, some evil people on the world stage. He's a head of state, you know. Is he perfect? No. You know, does he make mistakes? Yes. But do we know why he makes every decision? No. Should we judge him? No. I mean, again, if you're not sure, err on the side of the church. <laughs> and the church says, the first C is judged by no one, canon law 1404. So uh, let's stop these liturgy wars. Let's unify, let's love one another, let's respect each other. You know, I'm, I still want to go to a Latin mass. You know, like Keith Nestor said, he went to a Latin mass by accident and fell in love. He said it was love at first sight. I kind of got a feeling that that'll be me. Uh, so pray for me. So I'm enlightened to this. Uh, you know, I just, I go to the clo church closest to me. I'm blessed with a great priest, Father Derek. He was on the show. Another great priest, Father Fidel. I have two awesome deacons. And... They taught me how to be the best Catholic I could be. So I'm happy, you know. I received com I received communion with reverence, knowing that I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy, you know. But I'm thankful that by His grace, I get to receive it at every Mass. And, uh, you know, like Robert P. George said, I could be wrong. So God bless and stay Catholic.